Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. The breaking news over the weekend was Iran launching airstrikes against Israel. This caused the world to worry about whether the war in the Middle East would expand further. Of course, the biggest headache is President Biden. He doesn't want the U.S. involved in the war, but Israel is an ally, and he can't help but support Israel. This also creates uncertainty about further U.S. support for Ukraine. The Speaker of the House has faced challenges within his own party recently in Congress, but President Trump praised him for a job well done. So will this ease the Speaker's dilemma? European countries have used all kinds of resources in order to approach President Trump or his close staff to prepare for President Trump's re-entry into the White House. Two of the biggest names in the media, Argentine President Javier Malay and super-rich Elon Musk have met. They seem to be interested in doing something big together. Okay, let's get into it. On Saturday afternoon, Iran launched a drone and missile attack on Israel. Israel estimates that Iran has launched more than 100 drones. Israeli media also reported in addition to the drones, Iran also launched cruise missiles. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has issued a statement saying that the attack is in response to the IDF's earlier strike on a consular compound in the Syrian capital of Damascus. In a message to all citizens, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his government is prepared for this direct attack from Iran. He said, our defense systems are deployed. We are ready for any scenario, both defensively and offensively. At the same time, the Israeli military went on full alert, canceling all schools and other activities for young people. U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke with Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant on Saturday. Austin reiterated the United States' full support for Israel against attacks by Iran and its proxies. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan relayed a similar message of U.S. support to Israeli National Security Advisor Saki Hanage beyond X. President Joe Biden also cut short his vacation in Delaware on Saturday. He returned to the White House to discuss with the national security team the response to the Iranian attack on Israel. He also spoke by phone to Netanyahu. CNN and the BBC reported that two U.S. officials say that U.S. air defenses in the Middle East have intercepted a number of incoming Iranian drones. They did not specify how and where the U.S. intercepted the drones. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak condemned the Iranian regime's reckless attacks on Israel in a statement posted on X. He also said that Britain will continue to defend Israel and all its regional partners, including Jordan and Iraq. French Foreign Minister Stéphane Sojourn also strongly condemned Iran's attack on Israel on Saturday. He reiterated France's solidarity and commitment to Israel's security. Netanyahu said, We appreciate the U.S. standing alongside Israel as well as the support of Britain, France, and many other countries. We have determined a clear principle. Whoever harms us, we will harm them. Jordan announced the temporary closure of its airspace to all incoming, departing, and transiting aircraft beginning Saturday night. Lebanon also announced on Saturday that its airspace would be temporarily closed to all incoming, outgoing, and transiting aircraft. The Iranian armed forces seized an Israeli-linked container ship near the Strait of Hormuz, which is an important maritime route to the Persian Gulf. The Iranian attack on Israel could further exacerbate tensions in the Middle East, and it could trigger higher prices for crude oil and other products. So far, Iran's attack on Saturday have not resulted in any significant harm or damage, particularly by avoiding U.S. assets. It is widely believed that Iran and its proxies want to retaliate against Israel, but do not want to escalate tensions to uncontrollable levels. Israel announced at 7.30 a.m. on Sunday morning that it has reopened its airspace. Both Iran and Jordan also reopened on Sunday morning as well as Lebanon. 99% of the more than 300 attacks were successfully intercepted by Israel and its allies and partners, thus preventing mass casualties and damage to facilities. The Israeli Defense Forces released a video of Iranian drones and missiles being intercepted on X on Sunday. They wrote, this is what a 99% interception rate looks like. 
Daniel Hagari, Israel's top defense force spokesperson, said all the drones and cruise missiles were shot down outside Israeli airspace by the Israeli Air Force and its allies and partners, the United States, Britain and Jordan. Israeli military's correspondent Emmanuel Fabian posted a video on X with a tweet stating, very unique footage showing an exo-atmospheric interception amid the Iranian ballistic missile attack. Fabian said that the ballistic missile was shot down over Israel and the explosion was heard throughout the country. This caused the Israeli Defense Force to sound the alarm for fear of falling shrapnel. Iran launching an attack on Israel is a scenario that the Biden administration has been trying to avoid ever since the start of the current Middle East conflict. This is because it would put Biden once again in a tenuous position of pledging unwavering support for Israel while trying to prevent U.S. involvement in a new conflict. In the immediate aftermath of the Iranian attack, U.S. officials acknowledged that they were entering uncharted territory. An important question that remains unanswered is whether those Iranian proxy organizations might join Iran's actions and make the situation even more unpredictable. This is the election year, and Biden's next decision will be especially important. The Israeli-Hamas war is a difficult issue for Biden. His refusal to call for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza has led to a decline in support among his original Democratic constituency. Israel will respond to Iran's attack, but the scope of that response is yet to be determined. An Israeli official told CNN on Sunday that Israel is yet to determine whether to try and break all the dishes or do something more measured. In a post on True Social, President Trump slammed the Biden administration for being too weak. President Trump wrote, Israel is under attack. This should never have been allowed to happen. This would never have happened if I were president. In January of 2021, during his presidency, President Trump had authorized a U.S. drone to kill Qasem Soleimani, the Iranian commander, and President Trump announced the U.S.'s withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal. President Trump revealed that originally Biden had taped a speech in response to Iran's attack on Israel, but Biden's staff decided to stop posting it after seeing President Trump's post on True Social. Before we move on, I want to tell you about a story we published on Ganjing World. The CDC finally published the long-awaited reports regarding the pandemic that exposes shocking results and World Health Organization advocates are pushing members to sign agreements that grant this UN subsidiary broadly expanded powers, but can they really sign the deal? The opposition is growing fast as the deadline approaches. We discussed the details on our Ganjing World platform so that we could talk about them in more detail. I'll leave the link in the description below. Please watch it there. Okay, let's get back into it. After House Speaker Mike Johnson met with President Trump at Mar-a-Lago on April 12th, President Trump indicated the Republican Party would be open to providing additional aid to Ukraine if it was in the form of loans. This has turned the tide in the months-long impasse in Congress over Ukraine's military aid program. It demonstrated President Trump's influence. At a press conference at Mar-a-Lago, President Trump also said that Europe must be held equally responsible. We're looking at it right now, and they're talking about it, and we're thinking about making it in the form of a loan instead of just a gift. We keep Keep handing out gifts of billions and billions of dollars and we'll take a look at it but much more importantly to me is the fact that Europe has to step up and they have to give money we they have to equalize if they don't equalize I'm very upset about it because they're affected much more than we are the Ukraine situation would have never happened if I was president would have never ever happened and everybody says that including Democrats after months of debate in Europe the European Union finally agreed on March 13th to provide Ukraine with another 5 billion euros in military assistance through the European Peace Mechanism Fund Democrats in both the House and Senate have told the Hill that they would be willing to support aid for Ukraine in the form of a loan if the impasse could be broken, although it would not be their first choice. But Saturday's Iranian attack on Israel has added variables to whether Congress can approve new aid to Ukraine. Republican factions are seizing on this development to advance their argument on Ukraine aid. Senator J.D. Vance told CNN on Sunday, we're stretched way too thin with the number of weapon systems that we need, Ukraine needs, that Taiwan needs, that Israel needs, and we can't do all of these things at once. When you're stretched too thin, you've got to focus and you've got to rebuild your own country. 
Can we possibly fight all those conflicts at once? No. Vance argued that the U.S. should encourage Ukraine to adopt a defensive posture against Russia and the U.S. should focus more on Israel. Ukrainian President Zelensky, on the other hand, seized on Iran's attack, calling it a wake-up call for the West. He said that it's critical that the United States Congress make the necessary decisions to strengthen America's allies at this critical time. A chorus of foreign policy luminaries, such as House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Mike McCall, Representative Mike Lawler from New York, and House Intelligence Committee Chairman Mike Turner echoed that sentiment. House Speaker Mike Johnson said on Sunday that the GOP will send their package. Mike Johnson, the inexperienced Speaker of the House of Representatives, faces a brewing rebellion within his party as he seeks a bipartisan compromise to push for defense funding for Ukraine and Israel. Johnson, who was unknown on the national political scene when he became Speaker of the House as a compromise candidate among Republicans, now finds his position in jeopardy. But President Trump has given him a very big boost. President Trump commended Johnson for doing a really good job in a very difficult situation. We're getting along very well with the Speaker, and I get along very well with Marjorie. Uh, we have a Speaker. Uh, he was voted in, and it was a complicated process, and uh, I think very... Uh, it's not uh, not an easy situation for any speaker. I think he's doing a very good job. He's doing uh, about as good as you're going to do. And uh, I'm sure that Marjorie understands that. She's a very good friend of mine. And I know she has a lot of respect for the speaker. The most important purpose of the meeting between Johnson and President Trump was to discuss how to enhance the integrity of elections. They are urging support for a bill aimed at preventing non-citizens from voting in federal elections. I'm, I'm going to announce to you today, uh, here standing alongside President Trump, that we will do everything within our power to ensure that we do have free and fair elections in this country. If we don't have that in a constitutional republic, we have nothing. It's the basis of who we are as a nation, and we owe that to the American people. And so what we're going to do is introduce legislation to require that every single person who registers to vote in a federal election must prove that they're an American citizen first. They have to prove it. That will be a new uh, uh, part of the federal law and a very important one. Our bill will establish new safeguards. It'll put us on par, by the way, with virtually every other democracy around the world that also prohibits non-citizen voting. And, and this is a, a critical thing for us to do at a, at a very critical time. The new legislation requires states to remove non-citizens from voter rolls and it allows states to access Department of Homeland Security and Social Security Administration databases to help them do so. Johnson added that he expected the bill to receive widespread Republican support while also forcing Democrats to go on record with where they stand. With more than half a year to go before the November election, European diplomats in Washington, D.C. are scrambling to reach out to President Trump's allies in an effort to get the inside scoop on President Trump and to prepare for President Trump's return to the White House. During face-to-face -face meetings at private clubs, hotels, embassies, and think tanks in D.C., European diplomats invariably inquire about President Trump's policy intentions and President Trump's possible cabinet picks. And then they send that information back to their European capitals to inform officials who are eager to learn more about President Trump. An unofficial list of some of the former top Trump administration officials circulated among the embassies, including former Director of National Intelligence John Radcliffe, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien, and former Vice President Mike Pence's top National Security Advisor Keith Kellogg. The run-up to the U.S. presidential election this November stands in stark contrast to the run-up to the 2016 election when most diplomats assumed that Democrat Hillary Clinton would win. Few thought about the need to deal with President Trump's allies or any Republican foreign policy circles. Now they have learned an important lesson. With the prospect that President Trump will win another election, they urgently need to deal with President Trump's circle ahead of time. In some cases, diplomats are casting a wide net courting Republican think tanks and seeking meetings with former Trump cabinet members in order to get an indication so that they can be proactive. When 
NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg visited D.C. in January. He spoke at the Heritage Foundation about the future of NATO. The location was carefully chosen by Stoltenberg's team as a way to reach out to U.S. Republicans in light of the possibility of President Trump's victory in November. British Foreign Secretary David Cameron was the first to visit President Trump at Mar-a-Lago on the evening of April 8th in a surprise visit. The private meeting was arranged after the British government made a proposal to the Trump campaign. Argentina President Javier Malay visited Tesla's electric car headquarters in Texas on Friday and he met with Elon Musk. Malay's chief spokesperson said that the two toured Tesla's headquarters in Austin. They discussed a variety of topics ranging from solving the problem of declining birth rates around the world to defending freedom and pursuing the development of technologies. As one of the richest men in the world, Musk has previously expressed admiration for Malay's voice in support of private enterprise and his dissatisfaction with excessive socialism. Malay pledged his support with the legal proceedings against Musk in Brazil. In fact, even before these two celebrities met, Argentina was already moving to help resolve the conflict. Argentine Prime Minister Diana Mondino issued a hint to offer asylum to ex-employees if they are threatened with imprisonment in Brazil. The post reads, this government will always work for freedom, freedom of expression, and the freedom to live in a democracy. We ratify that our country and by extension its embassies will absolutely always provide refuge to all those who are persecuted for sharing these values. Elon Musk liked the post. Malay and Musk also agree to collaborate in order to promote free market solutions. Argentina's incoming ambassador to the U.S., Gerardo Wertine, noted that Musk and Malay also discussed lithium, which is believed to be a key to the rechargeable batteries that will be needed for future electric cars. Wertine said, We talked about the investment opportunities in Argentine in lithium. We're very committed not only to exporting raw materials, but also to adding value. Musk said we want to help Argentina. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you so much for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you. But please double check to make sure that you're still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. We've also heard that many of you don't get notifications of our videos anymore on YouTube. So when you do subscribe on YouTube, please make sure to tap the notification bell as well. Okay, that's our show for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth.